from Microbe TV. This is Twin, This Week in Neuroscience, episode 38, recorded on March 21st, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast about the nervous system. Joining me today from New York, Tim Chung. Hi. Hi, everyone. Nice to be back. It's been a while. I kind of forgot what neuroscience it's like two, was. Two, two months, right? It's, it's been a while, yeah. Yeah. Also joining us from New Orleans, Vivian Morrison. Vivian, you're, you're muted. muted. You're yep. muted. Hey, 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 I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. Yeah, I was trying to be um, like thoughtful and mute myself when I wasn't talking, but I'm clearly... Then you forgot about it, right? Yeah, <laughs> I forgot about it. I have holes in my brain. Yeah, they're, 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 that's pathogenic when you have holes in your brain. Yeah, It is. It is. It's a um, major... Unless they're the ventricles. Um, a major drawback. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> the place Wait, where you, you have actually CSF. Have, do you actually have holes? No, I mean... Okay. Uh, not, not to my knowledge... She's but, just saying yeah. that because it's kind I of like I do feel a, like I have holes in my brain. Yeah. Okay. Well, so, supposedly rumor has it that Ori might be joining us, but we're going to get started because who knows what rumors <laughs> have, have value, right? Mm-hmm. Well, we oh, have a paper uh, today that oh. I... Yes. Sorry, could keep going. Ori's looking for the link, so I'll send him the link. It's in the show notes. Okay, you guys keep going, though. You guys keep going. He probably doesn't have the show note link. That's the problem. You know, it's like it turtles all the way down, you know? <laughs> it's it's all links. Right. Links all the way down. You want me to wait for Ori? Whew. No, it's okay. We can go ahead. I'll just send him the link. All right. I picked a paper today and um, saw this a, a little while ago. I thought it would be interesting. My colleagues here agreed that it was interesting because what do I know about neuroscience, right? I have holes <laughs> in my brain too. So <laughs> this is a cell paper. It's called Immunity to the Microbiota Promotes Sensory Neuron Regeneration. And so I saw immunity there, and I saw microbiota, which, is the, the, which are the topics of two other podcasts I do, right? Immune and This Week in Microbiology. So I thought I, I might know something. Hmm. Anyway, this is... Uh, well, yes, I would say... Uh, Vincent, you work on polio, and polio infects for sure neurons, oh, yeah. right? Although, do they? Does it infect sensory neurons or motor neurons, or is it uh, non? Like, it doesn't care which type of neuron. <sighs> do you know? Do people it's know? Mo it's mostly um, the area of the brain where there are motor neurons, right? Ah, okay. With the gray okay. matter, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, uh, there's no reports of sensory alterations in, in polio either. It's just oh, but motor. for example. Um, but paralyzed patients, they can still feel yeah, they the, can. like, touch. Okay, yeah. okay, so it's a motor neuron. But, you know, okay. um, it's always been thought to be a neuronotropic virus, strictly neurons, right? Mm. And mm. we did some experiments a few years ago uh, in mice that said it can also infect astrocytes. Mm. Ah. We don't know if that happens in people. We probably will never know because hardly anyone can study it anymore. But, you know, if you infected an astrocyte... Uh, the astrocytes would become activated and release things that could damage neurons, and you know that could contribute to mm. paralysis as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the um, yeah, the the uh, that's why I, I told Lori that I would do twin because I work I work on a neurotropic virus. I used to for forty years anyway, so I could contribute something. But I don't know a lot about neuroscience. That's for sure. Well, how uh, many one. neurotropic well, yeah. viruses are there? There are quite a few. Um, it's it's not easy to get into the CNS for a virus. So let's see. Off the top of my head, we have uh, polio virus, we have measles virus, mumps virus, uh, West Nile virus, uh, and and these are measles virus. These are viruses that get in and then they reproduce there. So mm. some viruses get in and fizzle out, which to me, is just not interesting whatsoever. <laughs> I think that's the case with SARS-CoV-2. So, you know, among all the viruses that infect humans, not very few are able to get in the CNS. So I think it's hard because the CNS is well protected, right? Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. as it should mm -hmm. be because our essence is there. <laughs> it's us. <laughs> you don't want to. I mean, when viruses go in your brain, it mess things up. You can forget things. You can have alterations in smell and so forth. You can uh, have cognitive issues. You know, people who get West Nile encephalitis, sometimes they never go back to their old selves. Mm -hmm. So keep those viruses out of the brain. Yeah. But this paper is about uh, bacteria, right? <laughs> this is about bacteria playing a role in, in the regeneration of nerves. Hello, Ori Lieberman. Hello, hello. Long time to see everybody. Yeah. Uh, welcome to uh, This Week in Neuroscience. You're, you're in San Francisco, aren't you? All right, we're just starting with this paper. Um, this, this is work out of the National Institutes of Health from the laboratory of Yasmin Belkade, who's well known to do immunology of parasites. Uh, and to my knowledge, the first venture into uh, the role of immune responses and the microbiome in uh, neuronal regeneration, specifically sensory neuron regeneration. So let me uh, walk you through this and please everyone interrupt anytime with comments, corrections, um, questions. Uh, well, the questions, forget it. I can't answer the question. <laughs> As you know, we have uh, barrier tissues like our skin, and uh, these barriers also are full of uh, bacteria called the microbiome. And these, these bacteria are important um, for the barrier function. You know, the um, bacteria secrete little peptides that have anti antimicrobial, antiviral properties, uh, and they also have a function in development of the immune system. When you take bacteria away from mice, uh, they they have very poorly developed immune systems as well as other issues uh, as well, uh, and um, the um, the the microbiome has an interesting relationship with the immune system, right? Because our immune system is supposed to get rid of microbes, but they're a little bit tolerant of the microbiome because <laughs> we need the microbiome. So there's a, a very interesting uh, kind of detente there between the microbiome and, and our immune system. Uh, and um, in particular, there are T cells that are there and regulating things. They get rid of bad microbes, hopefully, and then they let the good ones stay there. Now, as you know, um, the skin, among other barrier tissues, is full of nerves, sensory nerves. And uh, this is how you feel things, you touch, you temperature, pain, itch, mosquito bites, it's all because of these sensory nerves. Did you know, by the way, when mosquitoes bite you looking for blood, they inject painkillers so you don't feel them and you don't swat them, right? Mm-hmm. Until way later, Although, then you feel this horrible itch. Uh, do you know Why? what it yeah. is? Is it, um, do you know exactly, do you know, do you guys have any oh, idea it's what it is? Oh, it's Benadryl. Oh, it is? No, oh, I'm just okay. kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, well, I mean, it could be like a similar molecule that you're saying. Yeah, like, I'm sure it's known. Like, I don't know what it is. But Dixon mm -hmm. de Pommier always says the mosquitoes inject a, a, a drugstore, a pharmacopoeia. They put in anticoagulants. Mm -hmm. They put in mm -hmm. painkillers. I mean, many, and people have looked at these. And actually, some uh, vaccines have been developed against salivary components of mosquitoes to prevent oh, them ooh. from delivering their stuff but anyway that's it's a diversion um so this skin is a, is a complicated place <clears throat> and you know when you get damage it has to uh fix it has to be fixed <clears throat> if you have damage of the skin and the nerves that are there uh they have to be fixed and the tissue has to be fixed uh and the nerves have to be fixed as well and the microbiome plays a role in that but what is not known uh, is whether adaptive immunity, so by adaptive immunity, we mean antibodies and T cells, uh, the part of the immune system that's tailored to the pathogen, right? It takes a little bit more time to induce, but you know we have antibodies directed against epitopes and we have T cells directed against epitopes. That takes time. What's the contribution of that to, uh, say, regeneration of nerves, in, in a skin when once they're damaged. And that's what this paper explores in a in a lovely way. They use mice and they use Staphylococcus aureus because this bacterium, we all have this on our skin, 
uh, and sometimes it becomes a pathogen. All of a sudden, you can you could have had this for years, and then you get a boil, and it's full of Staph aureus, and it's just a headache because it it festers and boils. It, that's where they get the name from, right? Uh, so so Staph aureus can be a commensal, which means it can live with you for many years without causing problems, or it can be a pathogen. Uh, and so in mice, it's the same. They have conditions where the staph aureus can be a commensal or it can be a pathogen. So, yeah, and in fact, isn't MRSA uh, from staph aureus? That's right. Methicillin-resistant like staph aureus. Ori, do you take care of that kind of thing in the house? You probably don't, right? You do neuro stuff, right? Uh, too, too much, though, but I'll tell you a funny story. We had uh, my son <laughs> went into the hospital with uh, neurovirus a couple weeks ago, and he, yeah. he wasn't drinking, and they they came out and they said, we have to tell you he's colonized with MRSA. So they must have done a swab. And he, I mean, uh -huh. it doesn't matter. I mean, everyone is probably colonized, but that's the problem with having two healthcare professionals as your parents. You're, yeah. probably mm -hmm. MRSA everywhere. Oh, that's yeah. so interesting. Yeah. So you can be colonized oh, with, with yeah. this, but if it's, if it's just a commensal, it doesn't matter. But if you, if you have a pathogenic situation, they try and treat it with an antibiotic, then you have trouble, right? Yeah. Exactly. So it's good to know that. But the, but already the MRSA wasn't causing the neuro. No, no, no. no, 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 no. Neurovirus. Okay. Okay. No, so norovirus has been going around this winter. We've had big outbreaks uh, throughout the U.S. And um, do you know the original name for norovirus gastroenteritis before we knew it was a virus? I bet none of you know this. The two bucket mm. disease. Well, that's the kind of that's the that's the colloquial name. No, it used to be called winter vomiting disease. Mm. Oh. Isn't that a lovely, colorful name? Yeah, in the winter you throw up. Mm. <laughs> anyway, back to the paper. Um, so they have a strain of Staph aureus that they have isolated from the skin of healthy mice. Right, it's a specific strain, and that's important because actually the the results they find can differ depending on the strain of Staph aureus. And so if you take mice, say, say newborn mice, and you put this Staph aureus on the skin, it will grow. It will establish a colony, a, a, a relation. I don't want to say colony because it looks like, that sounds like a little colony on a Petri dish. But it colonizes the skin for many, many weeks in what we call a homeostatic relationship. Everybody's fine. The mice, the mice are fine. They don't get sick. They don't have skin lesions. There's no epidermal thickness. There's no neutrophil infiltrate, which all would be, you know, representative of a pathogenic state. But there are a lot of T cells that come in, and these T cells are are CD4 cells, which are helper T cells. You know, as you know, there are many kinds of helper T cells, and these happen to be T helper 17 cells. That's because they make IL-17 among other, uh, other things. So you colonize the mice with Staph aureus. These T cells are coming in to the skin, and they last for a long time. Now, if you could take the same strain of Staph aureus and you, you inject it intradermally into the skin, now it becomes pathogenic. It causes tissue damage, it causes inflammation, and instead of Th17 T cells, you get Th1 T cells, which are the kind that, that should be responding uh, to this kind of infection. So this is really interesting. You know, whether you, you put... The staph aureus on the skin or you inject it gives you two very different outcomes, which is the way virulence works. You have to always specify how you're giving an organism to an animal as part of your description. Okay, so we find that staph aureus is virulent. And another lab says, well, in our lab, it's not virulent. And it's, well, how do you put it in the mice? Well, we just rub it on the skin. Well, we inject it. So that's the difference. You get my drift? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing that it causes completely different response in, in the mouse. And that's why yeah. hmm. when people say this isolate of SARS-CoV-2 is virulent or less virulent, I don't believe a word of it because they haven't done any, all the right experiments. And in people, it's even harder to figure out. So the, the impact of the um, Staphylococcus aureus, is it like... Uh, I mean, how how is it signaling through the, or is it having an effect on the skin cells and then, you know, they're kind of propagating some signal that um, 
you know, is going to stimulate the uh, TH17 cells or they're like bits of it that are getting in or... Oh, that's a good question. We don't know in the end. That's mm. that's what they say in the discussion. We don't know how this is working, but presumably mm. there's some kind of signal. Maybe they're sensed. Maybe they're mm -hmm. si maybe they're producing something. We don't really know. Yeah, yeah, so the skin cells probably they express some receptor for something on the Maybe. Maybe. So even though it doesn't and it doesn't yeah. have to internalize it, it just starts some yep. cascade. All I'm speculation. Guessing like the I'm guessing the, the antigen presenting cells that like survey your skin um, just underneath the skin and then they would pick up bits of microbes that might seep down or something and then mm. once they find it, they might go to the lymph node and kind of tell T cells to become TX17 cells. Although something this would like be that. something that probably is happening. Well, so the, the, the production of the um, TH17 cells, is that... Are there memory T cells or just memory? Yeah, yeah, sure. Oh, there okay, okay, be memory yeah. TH17s, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Absolutely. That's why it says, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so presumably this kind of, um, you know, interaction would be occurring from uh, maybe around birth or whenever you're- Probably, Whenever yeah. you get colonized. Most likely, yeah, shortly after birth when the mice are mm -hmm. out in the cage or in the wild, right? <laughs> and- mm -hmm. um, well, Mothers. Although for this exp for this experiment, they particularly apply the staph aureus. So, like before the application, the mouse, I'm guessing, is yeah, staph aureus sure. clear, sure. and then they the experimental manipulation is putting it on the Although, skin versus injecting it. But since it's a different strain, it could be that it's on top of whatever's there. You know, I'm, I'm not sure. Ah, mm. that's right. That's right. Mm, um, interesting. I don't know the age of these uh, these mice. All right, so then they wanted to know if um, if these TH17 cells, you know, could provide protection against a pathogenic infection. This is not really related to the main uh, topic of the paper. But they do a series of experiments where, uh, you know, they colonize mice and then they infect them intradermally. And basically, uh, they find that having encountered the staph aureus as a commensal has no impact on how you respond to a, a, a pathogenic infection, suggesting that there's two different things going on, right? They, they call the alternative roles for TH17 cells in tissue pathology. So they're very separate immune responses. I think this must have been very surprising for the, for the researchers. Probably. Like they must, have, they must have thought that if you colonize your skin with staph aureus. Yeah, it would protect you. Yeah. Then, then later on, when you accidentally cut yourself and some staph aureus goes into the wound, which gives you kind of like an infection phenotype, maybe one, if you were previously colonized, then you won't trigger a very huge reaction. But that's not what they found. You still trigger quite a big yeah. reaction yeah. and you still mm -hmm. get infected. And that's why they think maybe this, the TX17 cells doesn't protect you from future infection but does something else that is right, completely unexpected. Right. Mm -hmm. So now they want to explore um, what these TH17 cells are doing. So they do a series of RNA-seq analysis. In other words, they take cells, they extract RNA, and they sequence it all to find out what genes are turned up or turned down. So they, what they do is they, um, they have mice that are colonized with Staph aureus, and then a few weeks later... They isolate uh, th either Th17 cells from the colonized mice or uh, Th1 cells from the mice where they've injected the, the bacteria intradermally. And then they do RNA-seq analysis on both populations and they say what's changed. And so, you know, as you might guess, uh, uh, there are a lot of genes associated with being a Th17 cell, not just IL-17, right? but there are others, and they see all of those that are more expressed in TH17 cells. But they also see a lot of upregulation of transcripts in these colonized mice related to tissue repair, right? Like VEGF and TGF, beta, furans, matrix metalloproteinases, transcripts encoding proteins that are involved in tissue repair. And that's not what you see in the uh, the TH1 cells that are from the pathogenic situation. But they also had, and maybe this is what, you know, got them to do this whole study. <laughs> the, the TH17 cells produce higher levels of transcripts 
related to neuronal interaction and regeneration. New th I don't know any of these genes, but uh, th I, I believe them when they say they're involved in that compared to TH1 cells. So what is a CD4 cell doing making uh, proteins involved in neuronal regeneration? They probably said, let's find out, and that's what they did for the rest of the paper, right? So can I ask a quick question? I wonder. Oh. Yeah, yeah. These are... These are both, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, this is a quick question. They're taking uh, essentially T cells that are local in the skin around the area of infection. Yeah. Or is yeah. this like a is this a global change in phenotype in some way, especially after the intradermal infection, which is probably having some systemic cytokine response? No, they took the skin uh, CD4 cells only. They didn't do the systemic. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Yes, Tim. Um. Oh, oh I'm, I'm just to answer Ori. I wonder if the T cells, after they got um, became like TX17 or TX1 cells, they probably home back to the place where they were triggered to begin with. But that's my assumption. I don't know if it's true. Well, yeah, uh, that's always the interesting question: is like the tissue resident versus the yeah, like the yeah. lymph node and all that stuff. Yeah. Well, or typically, mm -hmm. um, typically they, you know, they're act the T cells are activated in the local lymph nodes. And then they they leave and they go back to where the they go to where the infection is, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. they first have to be, you know, because you have a lot of T cells against billions of different epitopes, and so the some of the antigens have to be brought into the lymph node, presented by say a dendritic cell to the T cell, and then that one T cell says, "Yep, that's me," and expands to many many fold, and then they go out. Let's go, <laughs> let's go to the. And they have all kinds of gradients of chemokines that they follow, and they get to the skin where the infection is, say. So that's that's how it works, yeah. Oh, I have another question regarding um, the T cells. And I was wondering whether it is um, surprising, not just that TH17 cells express things that interact with the neurons and nerves, but is it surprising that they also are involved in tissue repair, like in general? So for example, in patients that might have um, TX17. Um, I don't know if there are patients with um, like impaired TX17 cells, like eight patients. Do they have fewer TX17 cells? And if they have like impaired wound healing, I don't um, know. It's a good question. I, I, I bet there are. Do you know, Ori? I I actually don't. It's an interesting question, but there's this like a phenomenon where. Um, if an H if a patient with HIV has a very low CD4 and count nadir, so that like they come in and they have AIDS and they have 10 CD4 cells, even if later on they're on ARVs and they have a like a fully normal CD4 count, the idea is that there's like a repopulation um, that is kind of doesn't uh, quite um, span the breadth of normal diversity of T cells. So yeah. I want I do I do agree that's interesting. Like if if there is some lack of like some regenerative uh, T help like helper cell population. So a quick search reveals a paper where they had a cohort of people who were particularly susceptible to candidiasis, mucosal candidiasis, right? And they have the Th seventeen deficiency. Mm. So I'm sure there are other. Uh, situations where there are TH17 deficiencies, yeah. And, and Vincent, these TH17 cells, they're particularly sensitive to the microbiota. Like the, if I remember correctly, like they are, they require like these segmented filamentous bacteria for de their yeah, development. That's right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. The, these, yeah. for whatever reason in my mind, are a subset of helper T cells that are perhaps more dependent on the microbiota yeah. for further development. Yeah, in fact, there was a guy, mm. there's, there is a guy at Columbia yeah. who uh, worked on those uh, originally with... Um, um, the guy at NYU. Dan Littman at NYU. Dan, Dan Littman, yeah, yeah. And identified them, segmented filamentous bacteria that are needed for the, at least in the gut, for the generation of TH17 cells. And he went to, he's at Columbia now, he's working on them, yeah. Mm. Very, very good, yeah. All right. And the gut is just, uh, just your inner skin. Just your inner just, skin, yeah. Well, it's not yeah. as good because it's, it's, it has naked epithelial cells. Right? At least I don't, the skin some, has that dead layer of, of skin, right? Mm -hmm. So that's good. Although, 
Sometimes when so I like I'm preparing food, especially like chili, spicy chili, and I think if I stick my hand in this chili powder or this like cut chili for 30 minutes, my skin's gonna have a tough time. But I'm about to ingest it, and it's gonna go in there, stay in there for three hours. So I think my stomach is pretty, pretty good at doing well, whatever. Well, that's a good point, maybe. but. You know, the two are very different because the outer layer of skin is dead and that protects you. And mm. the outer layer of your intestinal tract is not dead <laughs> at mm -hmm. all. Right, right. But I, I don't know where the chili work. Maybe there are no capsa capsaicin receptors, so it doesn't matter, right? <laughs> uh, sometimes I feel it going in. Oh, <laughs> and coming out. <laughs> coming out too. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So back to the skin. As you know, the skin is, as we said, the skin has plenty of sensory neurons that sense your environment and uh, tell your brain, oh, "This is a fire here. Take your hand away from that." That sort of thing. So, uh, what's the relationship between these CD17 T cells and sensory neurons? So they have. This is a very cool experiment. Mm -hmm. They have uh, a line of transgenic mice that are. Um, they're transgenic for the T cell receptor that recognizes a, an epitope from the Staph aureus. So all the T cells will be recognizing this. And so you can take T cells from those mice and you can be assured that a, a vast majority of those are going to be recognizing Staph aureus. So they take those T cells and they transfer them into mice that have a green fluorescent protein reporter that, that is marking sensory neurons, uh, right? They're, they're transgenic mice that you can see sensory neurons by a green color. Uh, and so basically then they can look in these mice, in the skin of these mice by, uh, by microscopy. They actually use two-photon microscopy. And they can see that uh, these T cells snuggle up to the nerves, to the sensory neurons, which they've marked with GFP. Right within the skin, and if you do the same experiment with Th1 cells from mice, uh, they kind of go everywhere. They don't particularly like to go next to sensory neurons. So, <laughs> just so basically, putting Staph aureus on the skin promotes uh, Th17 cells to uh, co-localize with sensory neurons just beneath the skin. Of course, the bacteria are on top of the skin, and the and the neurons are within the skin. That's very I, cool. I thought. I thought it was. I thought it was cool, but you could imagine that there are other important, like there are other possible mechanisms that don't involve direct contact, right? Between sure. the set. Yeah, sure. yeah. So I was. I was intrigued that this was what they sat on, but you could imagine that there are secre like cytokine, there's cytokine secretion, or yeah, yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, it's a kind of a simplistic um, way. To, I mean, I would not have made an experiment that looked at it. <laughs> Because I would assume mm -hmm. it wasn't that simple. But yeah, there are probably other things going on as well because it's never binary, right? Right, yeah. And also, um, the, in the other case where they inject a TH, instead of TH17 cells that are kind of related to the commensal Staph aureus, yeah. when they injected um, presumably TH1 cells into a mouse who was infected with Staph aureus, so the skin is actually swelling and you get a rampant infection going on, um, if you look at the graph in the supplementary data, the neurons actually look like they have been damaged and are mm. retracting, mm. which I thought was potentially interesting. Yeah. Anyway, digression. No problem. Mm -hmm. So they, they further uh, go through this um, RNA-seq data uh, and um, they... they they say, okay, the, the genes that are turned on in these Th17 cells, they have a more of a uh, homeostatic profile um, as compared to... So when you infect mice intradermally, you get these Th1 cells, but you also get some Th17 cells, but they, they express a different set of genes, and these have a pathogenic profile. And the, the Th17s that are part of the, the, the commensals. Um, as I said, these express genes related to nerve interaction and uh, regeneration. And they go through a number of these uh, different sorts of genes. Um, 
then they want to know um, what what is the situation um, in th in these th seventeen cells that arise. So you you, you colonize the cell, the mice with Staph aureus, and then you infect them intradermally. Uh, what kind of um, what kind of genes are they expressing? And they they do RNA seq to look at that, and they basically find that the these TH17 responses induced by a commensal situation and then recalled in the context of an invasion, an inf invasive infection. Uh, they also uh, express enhanced nerve interaction and regeneration uh, gene signatures. I guess the implication is that in, in a pathogenic state, you're also going to have nerve damage, right? And so you need to have these cells coming in and, um, and repairing. Vincent, can I ask you a question? Uh, mm -hmm. This is a naive this is a, a neuroscience question, but it, kind of how plastic are the identities of these T cells? Like in, in neuroscience, I think of a neuron as being kind of terminally differentiated and you don't, you don't see dopaminergic neurons becoming cortical neurons in general, yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, are, is this TH17? So I, I guess, you know, I imagine that these T cells are differentiating the TH17 cells and then they, some of them have this homeostatic gene signature, but can that individual cell become less homeostatic with time or does it ever reverse like that? Yeah, I think that they're, they're not like neurons, right? They're, they're much more of a gray area, right? Because they're all T cells, which right. have a fundamentally common structure and activity, right? And then the number, the TH1 or TH17, is based on um, uh, it's based on cytokine production, but also uh, by flow cytometry, they look at surface markers and mm -hmm. define. And these can, I mean, you can have a Th17 cell, and and then you could further define it into subsets, right? Based right, on right. flow cytometry of subsets. So I think that there's a lot of plasticity, uh, and probably that's built into the immune system, right? So that these cells can be flexible. Yeah. So it's very different from neurons, absolutely. And this is one of the things that drives me crazy about immunology, right, is that there's so much uh, overlap sometimes and it's hard to, it's hard to grasp them. But <laughs> if I remember um, like watching some immunology lectures, the T cells also has a lot of um, paracline signaling. Yeah. So like they talk to themselves quite a lot. That's right. <laughs> so you can imagine... Like they can like potentially in response to some external stimulus, like switch state by just like expressing a different cytokine yeah. itself, and then that yeah. just completely changes something to something else. But just I don't know. I'm not an immunologist. Not an immunologist. Yeah. So then the next uh, series of experiments they want to look at uh, if these T cells can contribute to regeneration of peripheral nerves, and so here they use a, a model of skin injury that uh, causes exonal damage. They, they, do a, they do kind of like a punch biopsy in the skin. This damages the nerves. And as they grow back, they form a ring of nerve fibers around the injured site. You see these pictures that they have here. They're, they all look, there's a hole in the middle of them where the, they've done the biopsy with a small punch and the nerves are all growing back around <laughs> around that hole in the middle there. It's really... It's really mm. pretty cool. Yeah. And they actually did this uh, whole experiment in the ear of the mouse. The ear, yeah. So it's kind of like getting an ear piercing. Like it's or, actually analogous to Oh, that. this is interesting also because we often, we ear punch the animals yeah. to get, to like right, tag them. Right, sure, that's so, sure. Hmm, this is, could be a, yeah, I wonder if this is a confounding factor. For it could be, sure. <laughs> studying some of these things. Yeah. Could be. No, we, uh, one of the last experiments I did at Columbia was to immunize mice with different viruses and I had to ear punch them to, to tell which was which and mm -hmm. who knows if that makes a difference, right? You know, we never looked at it, but yeah. could. And, and related to what Ori is asking uh, before, I wonder if they do like punching one ear but colonizing on the other ear, whether that does anything. Yeah, who yeah. knows? All right, so mm -hmm. you have this ear punch assay. So if you put Staph aureus on the skin and you do the ear punch, you get more TH, uh, CD4 positive T cells, TH17 cells accumulating at the periphery of this, what they call a regeneration ring. 
compared to mice that don't get Staph aureus, right? So with Staph aureus and the ear punch, more TH17 cells around the hole there. Uh, and in, what they also find is that the, um, um, the, the Staph aureus increases the area of the nerve fibers, their volume surrounding the injury site. So basically they, they think this is enhanced neuronal regeneration caused by the, this commensal. They can use another kind of Staphylococcus, Staph epidermidis, and put that on as a control instead of the Staph aureus. Uh, and it actually decreases the nerve fiber density after the, the punch biopsy. So different staph can have different impacts on neuronal uh, repair. Which is really weird. Yeah, I don't know why it would like, be why, like that. How, yeah. how to explain any of this? <laughs> I, I guess, it's yeah. just evolution. That's what happens, right? But yeah, I guess we we'll talk just about throw maybe our towards hands the up end. And walk away. But like, does this actually serve a purpose for the mouse, like in terms of evolutionary advantage? Well, no, yeah, I mean, like, that could be looked at. That could be looked at. All right. So then um, they have they they want to know the role of uh, IL seventeen here. So now they have two kinds of experiments. They have antibodies against IL seventeen that that will block the cytokine, and they also have IL seventeen knockout mice. So they do this experiment. Again, they punch the ear and then they uh, do with and without Staph aureus and look at the nerve regeneration. And either treatment with antibodies or knockout mice, you um, have a, a deficiency in, in neuronal re regeneration. It's less. It's not zero, but it's it's much less. And uh, oh, I just, yeah, can I just quickly add, just in case our listeners like me who don't know much about immunology, <laughs> um, IL seventeen is actually. Um, the thing that defines what TX17s right. are. So right. TX17, T helper cells, 17. The hope that one of the main role is to make IL17, which is interleukin 17, which is a, a protein secreted to tell other things to go and do whatever inflammation things they're supposed to do. Right. So it's kind of like the, the effector of TX17 cells. And that's why it's important to knock it out to see if yeah. it's TX17 right. cells important. Uh, so basically what we find now is if if you, uh, st Staph aureus, in the context of a neuronal injury, we have the TH17 cells go near the, the skin neurons, they're enriched at the edge of the injury site, and they can promote uh, nerve regeneration, as we just saw in these knockout and antibody studies. Um I just want to say, like, if, when you if you look at the pictures that they've shown with the uh, enhanced neuronal regeneration yeah. uh, of the sensory nerve after the which one are injury, you looking at, Tim? Um, figure three. So you see the. So I'll just describe for the listener. You basically you see a hole that got punched out mm -hmm. uh, from the skin biopsy, right. and then you see like a corona, kind of like an ellipse around it. That is really, really bright mm -hmm. in the in the mice who got colonized with Staph aureus. Right. Um, so there are like a lot, a lot more neurons around the injury site than than maybe normal. Well, uh, so normal are the mice who didn't get Staph aureus. Um, and I just look at that and I just think that looks like it would be very painful because there's so many yeah, sensory neurons. There. I actually want to say there's. I mean, they made talk about this and maybe show something later on. I actually do see, I know we try to avoid talking about the figures because the, although I think a lot of the listeners do try to go find the papers afterwards, um, or at least some of them do. Um, with the figure that we're talking about specifically, they're using a marker that is a cytoskeletal protein in a neuron. And so in the pictures that they're showing here, we're really just looking at the processes. We're not looking at the actual cell bodies. So without having what they do go on and look at um, cell bodies in the dorsal root ganglion, which is where these, uh, the, the soma, these neurons are. But just seeing this, you don't actually know if there's neuronal regeneration. All you know is that there, it, it could very well be like sprouting. Mm -hmm. You know, which, um, like Tim, you were saying, could be very painful. That is true because we often have like people who have, um, I mean, Ori knows more about this because, uh, you know, he's a doctor, but um, like neuromas and abnormal sprouting can um, lead to this kind of like ectopic and aberrant uh, behavior that we then interpret as pain. 
um, even though there may not be any inflammatory stimulus present. Um, so they do go on later to look at, at specifically at the dorsal root ganglion. Um, so I think they do see some changes in the um, actual number of beta tubulin expressing mm -hmm. soma, somata. Got it. But I just think it's, you know, when we say neuronal regeneration, you know, sure. at least for me, it's like there's axonal and then there's the actual neurons because like, so also to note in the dorsal root ganglion, like, I mean, actually, I, I'm trying to think about like these, uh, these cells don't actually have, they don't have, uh, you know, they're post-mitotic. Right. Neurons are post-mitotic. There are no precursor cells. Y if you have like uh, an injury like, um, what they do here with later on, like a uh, sever, severing a nerve, you can have, um, you'll have a proliferation of precursor cells, but they're glial precursor cells and they generate Schwann cells and they'll migrate and help migrate into the, where the lesion is and help with mm -hmm. axonal regrowth. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm actually not, so now I'm like conflicted about the word neuronal regeneration and what okay. they're showing. I'll have to think. They don't actually that. discuss it, but it sounds like reasonable objection. Yeah. Okay. Remember, they're not neuroscientists, right? Right. That's exactly okay. what, I mean, that's one thing to, to take into account. Yeah. I mean, Claire, the, the second to last author, Claire Le Pinchon, is, is a, like a really good sensory neur neural biologist. Okay. So she um, should have known. Yeah. But I, so one question I had was in this figure, so in, in figure 3A, I know we're not supposed to talk about the figures, but the CD4 staining here. It is increased uh, in the topical association, but they're not. The controls are not germ-free, right? It's like it's an interest. It's interesting that you just have topical association of staph, and that inherently increases the density yes. of T cells. Whereas there yeah. are bacteria on the other, the ears on the other side, right? Yeah, for sure. They're not germ-free now. So then they do a series of experiments to see if IL seventeen actually can directly promote uh, nerve regeneration, right? Um, assuming that's what it is, uh, Vivian, right? <laughs> uh, change, changes in neurons. <laughs> changes, yes, some kind of change. But I, I think they just mean like axonal yeah. or the dendritic process. Yeah, I actually don't have a problem. Like this is, this is inherent, like in some ways, re of the skin is neural regeneration, maybe neurite regeneration. Neural, neural, not neuronal. Well, okay, right. yeah. I mean, this is, yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm sorry to, to, you know, like pick at it, but in the things that I work on, it's important to make the distinction. Mm -hmm. So they uh, isolate dorsal root ganglia sensory neurons. So these neurons have uh, axons that innervate the skin. They project to the spinal cord so they convey sensory information to the central nervous system. Uh, and um, w when you dissect these out, that is that damages them. And that is uh, actually a good model for studying injury and uh, regeneration. So they take out these dorsal root ganglion neurons. Those are from mice. Uh, and then they put them in culture and they expose them to IL-17, the, the, the cytokine, in the culture dish. And after a day of that, this turns on uh, they look, look at RNAC, it turns on a number of genes um, that are um, differentially expressed comparing the, the ganglia cultures that are just treated with a control, right? And these genes are involved in neuronal maintenance and regeneration, neuronal development, migration, differentiation, axon out outgrowth. Uh, so that's one category. The second category are genes related to uh, neuronal excitation, synapses, neuronal metabolism. Um, and then there are also um, genes related to antimicrobial defense. Complement genes, antimicrobial peptides are all turned on, which is, again, another function of these cells. And these, uh, again, adding IL-17 to these DRGs turns up uh, RNAs for matrix metalloproteinase, epidermal growth factor. These are healing Trans encode healing proteins, wound healing, and keratinocyte differentiation. So they conclude that IL-17 can somehow signal directly to neurons and induce a repair program related to both skin repair, epithelial cells, right, 
and to uh, neuronal repair. And how that's happening, that's a good question. I don't, you know, presumably there's a receptor on the neurons, right? That it's mediating this. Also, it's interesting that like the, in uh, panel A of, I think, figure four, when um, they're showing you this heat map of things that are upregulated, in those three categories that you mentioned, things that are upregulated or downregulated, depending on uh, IL-17 uh, administration, that last one, complement, um, is interesting that that's being generated by the neurons. And I know that, um, like, that's in, like, we've done, you guys have done a paper before about, um, about that being involved in Alzheimer's. synaptic pruning, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's all, <clears throat> the other thing I found interesting was that this is a distinct mechanism and kind of what I was alluding to earlier than the direct contact between the TH17 cells and the neurons, right? So here we're yeah. looking at essentially like a secreted factor that is in the, the culture supernatant that they're adding and there's nothing to do with a direct contact. So maybe I guess by being close to the nerve, there's, they're increasing the like concentration locally of the IL-17, but it doesn't mm -hmm. necessitate like direct interaction between two cell surface proteins, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that is super interesting because it's like, you know, you can be not very dense, like the cells could just upregulate IL-17, right? Rather than needing to recruit more cells necessarily. I don't know. It's just that I feel like there's definitely more to dig into there with future studies understand like how does the concentration of IL-17 in the tissue change um, over the course of repair or something like that? And where do those cells go afterwards? How long did, I don't know how long they took these out, but, or like, you know, what happens? I guess those IL-17, the T helper cells would die maybe? Yeah, eventually, yeah. Because they're, they're effectors, they're not memory cells. They don't last mm -hmm. a long time, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think in figure one they shows if they show once you colonize the skin with um, staph aureus, you see an increase of TH17 cells peaking at about two to three weeks, yeah. and then it does kind of slowly come back That's down right. after sixty yeah. days. Mm -hmm. yep. I mean, yeah. The, uh, the, it, sorry, I'll, I'll let you go on, Vincent, in a sec. But the other no, interesting no, thing okay. is that in the in the next figure they do show. I mean, what looks like actually a complete abrogation of the phenotype in the IL17 receptor alpha the conditional knockout mice, right? A neuronal knockout. Correct. So so there is, it is kind of all mediated by cytokines and cytokine signaling. Mm -hmm. it, it's pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. Next, the next series of experiments um, are focused on a transcription factor called ATF3. And this is um, really important for the transcriptional program that happens in neurons after they're injured. So it's like a master regulator. And in their experiments, when they do these punch biopsies, they see upregulation of ATF3, which is what you would expect. And they, the upregulation of ATF3 is similar to the upregulation of the, uh, the receptor for IL-17, IL-17RA. And if they have neurons... Uh, lacking ATF3 where it's been knocked out and they make less IL-17-ARA receptor than, un than uninjured neurons. So it looks like um, this is part of a conserved response. The upregulation of, of IL-17 and, and its receptor uh, in neurons uh, potentially controlled by this transcription factor. So then they do an experiment where they uh, use... Uh, targeting gene engineering to delete the IL-17 receptor specifically in injured neurons. And so then they can, so they do the injury, they knock out uh, the uh, the receptor. They can show that mice which have staph aureus, if you delete the receptor for IL-17 in injured neurons, you impair this nerve regeneration that we've been talking about compared to controls. So they say direct evidence for IL-17, IL-17 receptor in this regeneration pathway. Mm -hmm. Very elegant. It's very cool, right? Mm -hmm. And then finally, also they... The, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, the amount of effort that you have to put into making sure that these experiments work with administering <laughs> the drug that would then stimulate the production of this enzyme that will specifically cleave out the gene you want to remove. 
Like it's a, it, it, you know, it's in one, it's one nice panel, but it's so much work. It's a lot of work, yeah. Mm-hmm. They also look at a, a different, so they say a fraction of cell bodies in these DRG nerve, neurons are, are TRPV1 positive sensory neurons. And they also find that these are, um, these upregulate IL-17. So the trip V... So V1. they are the trip V1 uh, uh, protein. They're actually a channel, and they are the one that talking about um, capsaicin and eating chili. Ah. They are the one that these uh, channels cause when they open. They cause the neurons to fire. I see. And normally they're activated by heat, but they can also be chemically activated by capsaicin and chili powder and yeah. all those guys. And were the basic. So, yeah. So th- so they are part of. Sorry, already. No, I was going to say, we're the basis for the Nobel Prize last year for David Julius, right? Was his yeah. molecular characterization of these channels. Yep. Yeah. But they're usually thought of as part of the neurons that sense heat. So they're the sensory neurons. Um, Tim, uh, I'm just curious. I don't think mm-hmm. they... they um, The trip, trip V1, like the, those channels, they... Um, wouldn't be like up, would they be upregulated after in this injury um, situation? Or is it just like, are we, when we look at like the trip V1 um, in situ hybridization there, like, um, do you think that there's going to be more trip V1 positive cells after injury than pre injury? Absolutely no idea. <laughs> okay. Cause I've just, there's some other stuff I've heard about how like after injury there, uh, or in like culture situations, there actually is like an upregulation of, um, these capsaicin sensitive uh, channels. And also I've seen like, um, I can't remember what, what it was, but you can actually have changing pheno. It seems like changing phenotypes of neurons. So like I know Ori mentioned, like mm-hmm. you won't see, you know, a cholinergic neuron suddenly looking like, uh, you know, dopaminergic or something like that. But um, I wonder to what extent that uh, persists in the peripheral nervous system. And we may have more plasticity there than we think. Yeah, I don't know. I do know, like, if I have an injury and it's swollen, part of the inflammation process is heat. Like, you feel mm, it's hot. Of the but blood. I always thought it's just from vasodilation yeah. and, as opposed to more trip V1 sensing heat. But I don't mm, know. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> they actually also delete the IL-17 receptor in these trip V1 positive sensory neurons and show if you put the staph aureus in them, the deletion impairs uh, regeneration in this punch biopsy uh, repair model. So another, another a separate set of uh, sensory neurons. So the last yeah. so that re- yes, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. Just just that really does show that the, the sensory neurons are sensing the IL of seventeen yeah. from the TX seventeen because when you remove the receptors from these sensory neurons, yeah, that's it. Then they yep. do not regrow as well. Yep. Yeah. But they don't die. They don't or disappear. They just they don't, don't regrow. They don't regenerate, yeah. Hmm. So the last experiment is all about pain. <laughs> so um, this repair is presumably uh, leading to some pain, right? Uh, which they can, uh, they, they measure by mechanosensor sensation in mice. Um, uh, so I guess... It, you know, applying pressure uh, to the mice, you can you can measure their response to that. Uh, it's called the von Frey test. <laughs> Should I tell yeah, you? Yeah, they what have the- they have little. Yeah, because um, it's fun. <laughs> I mean, I think Tim would probably do. All I know is they're filaments of different size, right? Yeah, go ahead, or Tim. That, tell us about it. You, yeah, you sound, tell us about it. I don't know much about. I mean, I've seen this some pictures of it. I've never done it myself, but it's like little. Um, filaments of like bendy metal yeah. and how strong they are can be tuned. So, um, so some are bendier, some are more stiff and then you just kind of poke the mouse's foot from underneath yeah. and see how much force you need to exert before the mouse go, oh, get off my foot, please. But there's a retraction, um, right? Mm-hmm, before they uh, like right, withdraw the, the mouse their, takes away, yeah, withdraw yeah, their they withdraw their paw. So it's not like it's not. It doesn't draw blood, as far as I can tell. Right. It's just uh, disto- like it's just like pokey. annoying to the mouse, or potentially a uh, pokey, ticklish, maybe. I don't know, but yeah. But you're just there trying to tickle a mouse from underneath. 
So how do you pronounce it? Mechanical allodynia? Mm-hmm. I don't know, Ori, you're the yeah, doctor. Yeah, now. Al- al- mechanical allodynia. Yeah. So uh, it, like, well, what does that mean? It's Well, you know, we should let the clinician talk about it. <laughs> I mean, al- allodynia is, just, is like a hypersensitivity to pain. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, pain due to a stimulus that does not normally provoke pain. Exactly, exactly. So there, there will be patients who have sensory problems who will fa- feel pain to just light touch, for example. But is that not part of the healing? Like if I'm if I if I if I have a hole punch in my skin, I would feel much more pain if you touch it than normal, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, but that's so the thing that they're like showing, right? That the punch. threshold is lower for evoking pain in the punched animals, right? In in Figure Five, right, right. Does that? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. so, but that's not not necessarily. Path- I don't know whether it's pathological. Or no, not. I think that it's you feel more pain. It only becomes pathological when like wound healing is complete, or like Ori was saying, like you know, these uh, individuals feel pain, like just. At baseline, it's like, uh, you know, wires getting crossed. Yeah, I guess, I mean, the interesting thing about this topical association is that, I I mean, I'm spoiling the punchline here, but it it looks like the threshold strength is actually the lowest in the group that is topically associated. So you wonder about whether this is actually a maladaptive outcome, right? Yeah, and it makes sense, like going back to what we're talking about, after the pole punch, you have so many neurons regenerate so many nerve endings regenerated around the wound site you kind of look at it and you think well probably that's painful and now they're poking the mouse foot from underneath and the mouse are going they're retracting the pores more so it does kind of at least acutely by acute i mean they did it seven days after the hole punch Hmm. and you see the mice Hmm. who had Previously, I'm both me and Ori are spoiling the punchline. No, okay. But uh, these colonized mice with staph aureus that with that has greater nerve regeneration or nerve ending regeneration, um, they are retracting their pores more, suggesting that they are more sensitive. Which at least they acute- probably should be, right? You don't want to have something else like, you know, rubbing salt into a wound. <laughs> right. Like right. But I think what this the beneficial does- nature of pain. But this does show the functional outcome of increased sensory neuron regeneration or neurite regeneration that they're seeing in all these beautiful microscopy images, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Did they show how long this, like, is this stable, the neurite outgrowth? Does it persist? Uh, Because they show, they have, like, they test it long term as well, the the, um, Mm -hmm. um, sensitivity to these little pokes. And there's no difference... Um, across their groups, but does the, you know, does the neuronal architecture s- persist or does it die back? It gets back to normal. So to summarize did the it, last graph, we, no. well, we might as well summarize the last graph, which is these mice that are colonized with staph aureus and then you do a hole punch mm-hmm. in the foot. Well, you actually cause a small biopsy on the foot. It's not punching a hole all the way through. Um, when you do a small biopsy of the foot, um, the mice with the increased nerve regeneration, they retract more. They're more sensitive at seven days after the injury. Right. But by, I think, 28 days, so one month after the injury, the they're back to normal. That's right. That's right. And if you look at, so this is in the supplement. Uh-huh. So if you look at the nerves, seven mm-hmm. days after injury, you see more nerves right. uh, regenerated. But by uh, one month after the injury, there are no differences anymore between the Staph aureus right. colonized mice and the mice that never got colonized. So there's pla- so it's plasticity. It, yes. Right. Yeah. Mm. Yes, so they, they are. S- go ahead. Sorry. You guys so go? I was just going to say, and, and, and the, I think that lest people think that they're, we're just causing pain to mice for the pure purpose of beautiful experiments, I think that there are two like implications of this data, one of which is that after injury, there is hypersensitivity and allodynia, like, you got, like we're talking about. And if we block this pathway, you could imagine that you have a new way to have to reduce pain after a mechanical injury to the skin. That's right. number one. Right. And number two is that you could imagine that there you might want to increase sensation of a part of the skin that 
has had a lot like a substantial injury to innervation or something like that. And this is a way that you could generate sensory neuron regrowth. So I think mm-hmm. that, I mean, these are super interesting pathways that, that have been opened up by or approaches that have been opened up by this paper. Good. Mm-hmm. Yep. Very interesting. So basically we find that a cytokine that acts locally, TH17, it's released by T cells, coordinates neuronal repair in the skin. That's very cool. I think mm-hmm. that's great. Um, so cool. What I, how it does it. What? You go ahead, Tim. Sorry. You turned uh, your video. Oh, there I, you go. Oh, um, what I don't understand is why would, if you are a, if you're a mouse and you have neurons that got damaged, why would you gate your neuron regeneration behind some bacteria? Like why, why, would it, why should it depend on the bacteria? Why shouldn't you just regenerate? Well, like, because, is it just an accident? Because the bacteria, are there. <laughs> the bacteria are there and you take advantage of them, right? No, but like, why go through the trouble of expressing TH17? Well, I don't so think it's trouble. CH17 yeah, receptor. I, mean, I don't think it's trouble. But, I think it's, you know, the, the bacteria were probably there first. <laughs> and so... No, but I was... Yeah, go ahead. But I was wondering whether it is actually a signal for your skin, like where, um, having your neurons damaged um, when your skin is cut. Yeah. So like from an external injury might be differently sensed by your neuron from a neuron, uh, for example, when you're um, during development, sometimes your neuron, neuronal axons get pruned and when they go away and it's an internally generated kind of neuronal, not damage, but degeneration, I guess, um, which is part of your developmental program, it, you might want your, you, your, you yourself might want to be able to tell whether it is an externally caused damage mm. or an internally caused damage. But I don't know whether it makes sense because there are other bacteria that inhibits this process. So it's not all bacteria that does it. So it's just baffling that. Well, I don't know. It, it does this. They, t- they only tested one bacteria. It could be that multiple do this, right? Right. Mm-hmm. I was going to say mm-hmm. it's like they need to be able to um, sense if there's more than one pathogen. Kind of like, yeah. uh, you know, when you arrive, when. You know, you arrive at a scene where some sort of accident has happened and they tell you to stop and look around first to make sure that whatever took that person out that you're looking at laying on the ground is not going to take you out too. Maybe there's something hmm. similar where it's like it needs to have a more global <laughs> picture of, of like what, what is an, happening. What that was analogy. a very evocative story. I know. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, you know, I have two small kids who are constantly at risk of running into traffic. So, you know, I have <laughs> to be like... Yeah, sure. All right, so that is the paper. It's pretty cool, and there's a lot of work to be done. I wonder, you guys, tell me what you think about this. They say this phenomenon, this IL-17 involvement, could underlie heightened pain, right? Because they say, although accelerated repair did not come at the cost of long-term altered mechanical sensation, we could speculate that under highly inflammatory settings, in which IL-17 is overrepresented, the phenomenon we uncover could also underlie heightened pain. In support of this, psoriasis, an inflammatory skin disease, mm-hmm. has been associated with both aberrant neuronal mm-hmm. density and enhanced pain. But, mm-hmm. Yeah, and that, that makes sense. If I'm not mistaken, that's a disease state where, IL, where monoclonal antibodies against IL-17 are in use. And I wonder if uh, in any of those trials, they actually looked at allodynia as an outcome as opposed to just kind of other uh, measures of disease mm. outcome. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And then one more stuff. thing. Um, this discovery opens the door to therapeutic approaches to potentiate sensory recovery after injury or to limit neuropathies in the context of diabetes and chemotherapy. So I'm, mm-hmm. I don't, is that, is that an issue with diabetes and chemotherapy neuropathies? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Huge issue. Huge, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and apparently, you know, I know, you, you know, could also be a problem after COVID. <laughs> you know, yeah, sure, maybe. sure. Which I, I would be interested in seeing. Um, so you'd have to see what's involved, if, if IL-17 is involved or something else, right? Could we lost In that York, particular, yeah. in those other situations yeah, or yeah. in the COVID situation? In, in uh, anyone that you're interested oh. in treating, right? Yeah, I mean, I looked it up earlier and uh, IL-17 is involved in, is involved in, you know, the... COVID response, at least. I don't know about in diabetes and 
after chemotherapy. But all right, that's and our, <coughs> that's our paper. Sorry, yes, just, go ahead, Tim. Um, go ahead. Before we go, I was just wondering whether TX seventeen is just how important it is for just in general neuronal function. I have to go, guys. But, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Goodbye, Vivian Morrison. Bye, guys. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Goodbye. Uh, I hope she doesn't anyway, yeah. uh, leave entirely. Oh my God. Because then she loses everything. Oh no. <sighs> All right. Anyway, let's wrap it up and see what happens with her files. All right. That's twin38. Show notes at microbe.tv slash twin. Questions, comments, the twin at microbe.tv. If you like our work, you should support us. We depend on your support. microbe.tv slash contribute. Ori Lieberman is at the University of California, San Francisco. Ori Lieberman on Twitter. Thanks, Ori. Thanks, Vincent. It's good to, good to be back. Yeah, we had a hiatus, but we should be back now. Hopefully. Yeah. Tim Chung is at New York University. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Vincent. It was uh, fun talking about this. And Vivian Morrison's at Tulane University. Who already left, so thank you, Vivian. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at microbe.tv. Been listening to this week in neuroscience. Thanks for joining us. We will be back next month. Bye.